It's June 9th, 2022. This is Rook. Welcome to episode 184 of Rook. I'm Gian Gobeshi. Hope you're keeping well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Salam Dustan Aziz Duru, Bashama. Hi, Groovy Shaya. Hi, Aziz. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. This is one of our Thursday thought based episodes that uh, we started doing. This one called The Iranian Origins of Psychedelics. So, Right up ah. your alley. <laughs> so there's been a notable, uh, I think, well, well, I don't think, there's been studies to show there's been a notable increase in the use of psychedelics in recent years mm. uh, in the West again, mm. um, both for recreational use and perhaps more significantly to help deal with psychiatric conditions, including depression, anxiety, uh, addiction. There's a lot of clinical trials happening to reinvigorate the idea of using psychedelics or psychoactive drugs. So psychedelics, uh, meaning um, LSD, falls into that category, ecstasy, mm-hmm. MDMA, uh, uh, psilocybin's like magic Ma- mushrooms, yes. right? Uh, in fact, magic mushrooms are a big part of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, so we're going to talk about that today. Correct. Actually, I'm really happy about this this trend actually personally magic mushroom helped me a lot really yeah 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 it broke the shell around myself and yeah i i i you believe in its healing qualities i yeah and like i wish i could like convince my family like my mom to uh, con- <laughs> consume it yeah to do to do, do, <laughs> to do, much, sure. do mushrooms with you or <laughs> Um, the, our guest, uh, Dr. Shaheen Etzminan, mm-hmm. this uh, Iranian-Canadian uh, scientist and futurist, yes. uh, he he has done a very interesting talk very recently, uh, not just about the psychedelics and the importance of them, uh, in his view, mm-hmm. uh, and the possibilities in mm-hmm. terms of health and mental wellness, mm-hmm. but he's done a talk about the ancient Iranian slash Zoroastrian mm-hmm. roots of hallucinogenics and psychoactive drugs. Very interesting. Very interesting. So uh, where the history comes from of this kind of of psychedelics, of the the utility of them, particularly in a medicinal or a wellness kind of um, perspective, uh, very interesting. So we'll get to to Shaheen Etzminan yeah. in just a little bit. In Tehran, by the way. Oh. Yeah. In, yeah. yeah. By the way, you, you know what, actually, guess what? What? Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Happy <laughs> birthday. <laughs> um, thank you very birthday. much. Actually, I, uh, truth be told, uh, I know it's my birthday because the staff here, uh, you guys were very nice. You know, gave me a little cake and yeah. there was a little... Uh, uh, there was some music and, and um, <laughs> yeah. uh, the ritual. I blew out the yeah. candles. It was very sweet. Just just a few minutes ago. Very nice. I had a very nice morning, birthday morning. I have a very sweet story to tell, oh. which is that I was in my kitchen and I stubbed my toe. Do you know what that means? It means like you, I hit my toe uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, against a, a stool. And I did one of those things where I was like, I really banged it hard. And so I was hopping around the room like, ah, you know, and then I fell on my side, kind of like uh, uh, in a football game, you know, <laughs> yeah, when the player like fakes <laughs> being hurt, except they really did hurt, but I didn't really need to fall on my side and roll around, but I did. Yeah. And then Oogie, my lovable French bulldog, yes. Uh, unrelated to it being my birthday, I think, you know, just out of uh, his instinctual desire to help. Um, uh, he is a therapy dog. I've told wow. you this before. He's trained to for therapy. But, but he runs over, um, kind of positions himself on top of me and starts licking to no. help me. And then he senses that it's my toe that hurts. And he starts and he goes down and he puts his uh. paw on the toe and starts licking and trying to help. Uh, it was just the sweetest, oh, yeah. purest form of of love. 
you know yeah. he's just like what can i do what can i do yeah. it was just so sweet that was wow. my that's my favorite birthday present so amazing, far amazing. Uh, although i did get a nice bowie sweatshirt but cool. uh but oogie oogie's love is <laughs> <laughs> just wow. the best and the uh, and you guys giving I'll me that cake and, yeah, exactly he's in the other room uh, we're coming to you on rookmedia.com. It's there that you can link to all of our platforms. We are on our ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. We're on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, CastBox, Instagram. If you'd like to see some visuals with Rook, switch over to YouTube right now. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and in Persian, check us out on Telegram. To support this program, go to rookmedia.com where you can become a patron uh, uh, press our support us button in the coming days on our program Ali Dorani mm. who goes by the name Eaton Fish as well mm. Eaton Fish who has a crazy distressing story of um, leaving Iran and um, needing to leave Iran being exiled ending up in a refugee camp outside of Australia mm. and working his way through that and saving his life through cartooning oh. and becoming an international cartoonist Paymon Salimi our friend oh. the uh, uh, the great um, singer songwriter and producer who's out on tour with Ali Azimi right now will be performing in the, the Rook studio Dr. Sina Jurab Chi will be on the program Shali Zomorodi oh. will be returning uh, she's got a new kids book Interesting. Yeah, okay. and so I'm excited to have her back on the program. And Dr. Shahab Anari will be here about professional coaching. And David Burnett, mm. who is a, you know who he is. Yes, I know you yes. know. He's a legendary photographer. And he is the man who famously, an American photographer who was in Iran. Um, he's got a book titled 44 Days about his time in Iran. Mm. He was in Iran for 44 days. Uh, at the moment when the Shah of Iran uh, ended up leaving Iran for the for the final time for his mm -hmm. last time, and Khomeini comes, mm -hmm. and David Burnett is not just a witness to history, but carrying around his cameras and um, takes a, a number of photographs that become the iconic photographs of the Iranian Revolution, including that piercing shot of Khomeini with the eyes that, wow. uh, you know, that portrait that everybody knows of yeah. of him that he caught um, Khomeini doing in a in a, in a press conference. Um, David Burnett had in, insane access. I mean, he was at times in a small room with Khomeini and mm -hmm. three or four other people, yes. Ayatollahs and stuff. So um, he's going to be joining us to talk about all of that. He, he's, he's a legendary photographer otherwise, too. I mean, he's done everything from Vietnam Vietnam to uh, Chile to the Olympics to etc. But uh, but it's his his time in Iran that is is really remarkable for the purposes of this show and very excited to have him on because um, uh, he's done a lot. Yes, yeah, I, I mean I, I looked him up and literally all the iconic picture of revolution are actually. his. Yeah, yeah, he's the guy. Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. Amazing. Um, okay, so that's coming up in the coming days on Rook. Remember, you can get in touch with us or comment on our programs at info at rookmedia.com. That's the website. Well, you may have caught the vibe that psychedelic drugs are making a comeback. Not that they ever really went away, but everything from chemical drugs to mushrooms are becoming more popular, not just as recreational fare, but for health and mental wellness treatments. And my future guest today is a scientist who is spending a lot of time in this field and has traced and presented the historic Iranian origins of psychedelics in a fascinating public talk he did recently. Shaheen Etminan is an Iranian-Canadian entrepreneur, activator, futurist, art enthusiast, mystic, and community builder. Shaheen was born and raised in Tehran. He moved to Canada to pursue his studies. He obtained both his master's degree and doctorate from the University of Calgary. He started a non-for-profit in 2010 called the Persian Gulf Foundation with a focus of reflecting the interests of a new generation of Iranian youth in the diaspora to uh, broader North American communities. He's also now the founder of Vicena. This is a CNS drug discovery biotech company focused on polypharmacology of natural neuropharmaceuticals for mental wellness treatment. 
Shaheen and his team make the case that they are leading a business model integrating ancient wellness practices with modern science to tackle the global mental health problems with safe, fast, and efficacious solutions. Recently, Shaheen led that talk I described entitled Chemically Induced Otherworldly Experiences of Zoroastrians in Iran in his appearance at a prestigious psychoactive drugs conference in the UK. And right now, Shaheen Etzminan joins me from Tehran, Iran today. Hello, sir. Hi, Jian. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Really nice to have you. Uh, nice to see you again, Shaheen. And uh, let me just state right off the top, let's clear this this up, that you have a PhD, uh, but you are not coming at this as an academic or as a as a doctor, you are you are in business, but your mission is also around mental wellness rather than the simple promotion of illicit drug use, right? Absolutely, yes. I am a full-time entrepreneur, uh, business person, as well as the scientist. So we, we do the science as well as the business at the same time. But yeah, I kind of left university back in 2013. Okay, just so we've stated the stated interest in this. But, but also, I know you have some personal reasons why you got interested in this field of psychedelic and psychoactive drugs. Can Tell me about the mental health issues you, you have witnessed and, and what inspired you to get into this field. Yes, yes, Gian. Um, yeah, this is related to actually the uh, two of my loved ones uh, struggling with um, addiction as well as PTSD, uh, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, and um, witnessing, you know, how their life as well as you know the life of people around them, which is which were my family, um, kind of was was ta- tackling a lot of issues. You know that always was part of my life to see how I can uh, come up with with solutions that then can help them. So with that and uh, with this whole new wave of psycho psychoactive drugs that are uh, getting to FDA as, as the new remedy for psychiatry as well as you know, uh, as a solution for mental wellness. So this was a time for me to jump on and you know just get to see what I can contribute based on my own emotional experiences from the past. Nice. Okay. Well, thanks for for setting that up for us. And I and I should just say at the outset of this conversation that if you are someone who's deeply involved in the in the use or, or the field of psychedelics, th- this will seem like a very simple primer. This interview, but I I, I do know we have a a wide audience, a a, a, a global audience, and I want to make sure that uh, every we bring everybody along in terms of what we're talking about here. So let me start with some embarrassingly simple explainers. Um, first of all, I mean, what are psychedelic drugs? The simplest definition I could find online is a a class of hallucinogenic drugs whose primary effect is to trigger non-ordinary states of consciousness. Does that work for you? And and if so, how do we define non-ordinary states? You don't define non-ordinary states. You have to experience it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Do your best to put it into words if you can. (laughs) Yeah, so um, I guess non-ordinary, we call it it mostly altered state of consciousness. So these are the states, like whatever we experience on a normal life is the ordinary state. So this is how we are interacting with each other, how we're building our society, how we're um, just living the normal life. But um, if psychologically we're pushed to, you know, experience um, our senses, let's say, if are different, if the flow of information in our brain are different, if the perception uh, are different, so all our reality would become different. So that is why they're called the altered state of consciousness, because basically you're processing information, senses, and even like if you have hallucination, you know, basically you see different things that you don't see in a normal life. So that is the definition of altered state of consciousness. Okay, and, and I've always used the term psychedelics to as a catch-all. It's kind of an umbrella term that includes chemical drugs like uh, LSD, which is acid, or MDMA, which would be ecstasy, and also, but also plants like peyote and uh, magic mushrooms, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there are tons of you know different synthetic as well as you know plant-based or mycologic-based you know or mushroom-based 
uh, psychoactive drugs that have been used over you know centuries or you know uh, like by indigenous people but most of the synthetic drugs are back to you know 1950s 1960s when for the first time this whole psychedelic movement uh, started before it gets banned again in 19- right. around 1970s right and just to stay with the terms for a second and make sure we're clear on them is there a difference between psychedelic and psychoactive drugs or is, are they just uh, interchangeable terms no they are they are different for example coffee is is counted as psychoactive so anything you know that's active on your you know on your mood on your senses is 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 counted psychoactive is a wider range of drugs psychedelic is mostly when you experience hallucination um or you i guess i guess visually you start to see lights or you know different other things that are in, in basically in the realm of altered states you know those are uh counted as psychedelic okay okay that's that helps and you uh, since you just mentioned it i should know i mean hallucinogenics were used famously uh, in in psychotherapy in the west in the 1960s but then halted uh i'm assuming mostly for political reasons what why, why was the usage stopped and um We'll get into the specifics, but why is it coming back into favor potentially? Yeah, they they never really brought to become you know psych, psych, psychiatric drugs. So there were research going on, you know, to bring them through FDA and clinical trials to become drugs. But um, th- during those reasons, mostly because um, there were you know hippies and like kind of more progressive people specifically like they're saying that the whole uh silicon valley is actually a product of of psychoactive or psychedelic drugs so nixon was kind of against you know this movement and um and that was the reason that the whole war on drugs started and then they kind of they banned the whole thing for research as well so the whole um the psychiatric study of psych- uh, psychedelics in a context of a drug or, or you know a medicine was stopped you know since 1970s and mm. it's been just recently uh that FDA actually came up with a new breakthrough therapy for psilocybin mushrooms that the whole thing started to get back again and the new uh, industry is it was born. So let me ask you about mushrooms. I, mean, I was looking at a, at a recent study from Nature magazine called Psychedelics Take Flight um, showing this massive increase in clinical trials using psychedelic drugs for um, psychiatric conditions. This is just in the last, say, five or 10 years. Uh, uh, Conditions including depression, uh, drug dependency, anorexia, uh, and by far the most tested and used drug has been psilocybin, uh, magic mushrooms. So, so what what are the effects of say psilocybin drugs beyond the the recreational nature that some of us have explored and, and enjoyed um, in terms of the use in a clinical trial for health benefits? Um, so, yes, yeah, psilocybin is probably the most studied um, uh, compound so far. And uh, the reason is that psilocybin actually has a complex, psilocybin is a compound when that, when it gets dephosphorylized, it becomes a compound called psilocin in, you know, in a, basically after getting metabolized in your body. And psilocin is, the molecule is very similar to the molecular of serotonin. So that is why any disorder, any mental disorder that is related to the deficiency of the amount of serotonin in your, you know, in your brain or in your blood, uh, psilocybin and psilocin can be, you know, a potential drug for. So this is more on the chemical basis. So the main area is major depressive disorder that, you know, this is one of the indications or pathologies that's been, you know, highly and vastly studied because there's so many, like in the US, there are only about like 17 or 18 million cases. And we become, you know, when you're looking into others, uh, you know, the type of depression is even become more, more wider, more and wider. Um, so, uh, but the reason that they're working is, is, a, is, is very uh, interesting at the same time complex. Um, so I can't get to that as well, but basically they put you in a state that you get a flush of thoughts at, like beside your senses that you can review uh, you're basically the state that you have been in. Mm. 
uh, plus you're more open, you know, to new experiences, uh, like psychologically. So that is how these mushrooms actually bring you to realize thing like things that are in your blindest spot about yourself. And that's the key, you know, for, so it, would it uh, be, and I know this is super reductive, but I'm trying to make this as, as simple as possible. If you, would it be that if I eat mushrooms, uh, the magic mushrooms, I, I would, um, would it be reactive like it would be treating a depression i'm feeling right now or would it be therapeutic somehow as a as a kind of preventative the, that uh, for me not to go back into that black hole um and it yeah it can be preventative and it can be you know a reactive as as well so like the depression in general the reason for depression is because our receptors and our neurons are not firing the required amount of serotonin in a normal basis uh, so the presence of these new molecules which are the, like like the pro drug can help uh, you know basically just the lack of these serotonin and that's that's the main reason that in the they call the synaptic you know space or synaptic cleft that that's where you know this this firing happens and and that can lead to uh, the state that, you know, basically physiologically, it allows you to feel better, but psychologically, it helps you, it's basically just uh, a state that you have a higher intensity, mm -hmm. or they call it a higher entropy of thoughts, which means that like different part of your brain are kind of like firing at the same time and, and it allows you to think very volumetrically. So you, you are able to think about a problem or anything, you know, that comes to your attention in a, in a wider way. So that's why they, they ask you, you know, for a, a therapeutic trip, they ask you to set an intention. That means that, so you go for a reason and you focus on a reason and then basically you get your answer from, from yourself for, for, for mm, that specific mm. Uh, Does the metaphor of medical marijuana work for you or no, because it's not a hallucinogen? No, marijuana is not a hallucinogen. Uh, marijuana is is binding to a very limited receptor, the CB1 and CB2. Um, so in some cases, they can be hallucinogenic too, but they are not counted as psychedelic. No, I just mean a metaphor as a heretofore taboo drug that's now becoming accepted as, at least in Canada, to be used mm -hmm. for med medicinal purposes, let alone rec recreational. Absolutely, yes. I think like even the number of so if you compare it with med with cannabis like cannabis they're still trying to figure out what type of uh therapeutic use it can have but psilocybin mushroom has like tremendous number of you know therapeutic uh basically contribution to our body so um yeah so that's why they call it magic and that's why mm. you know it's specifically if you do it in the right setting um Basically, it, it helps you know the mind and the state of the mind uh, mm -hmm. very significantly. I was going to say the only time I've the only experience that I've had on mushrooms is is babbling um, stuff that I think is really good philosophy. I wouldn't have time to be depressed, so it probably worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure if that's the actual medical uh, facility of it. But it certainly <laughs> it keeps me away from any anxiety. I'm too busy being a philosopher. Uh, <laughs> at the recent conference you spoke at that I've referenced addressing psychoactive drugs this conference you asked a question uh, which was how can ancestral knowledge deepen scientific research for global mental health so uh, how do you briefly answer that question before we get into the the history part of this well um you know, like I, I don't see the problem as a world to be political or even social. I think that most of the problems are just psychological. Like when you just dig it down, and and it's not a psychological between people of the same region. It's psychological between the people of the you know, different region in the world. Uh, so as I'm getting older and like learning more, I think this is this is where you have to build a platform for people to love each other. You know, to be more open to each other um to understand you know each other better yeah i definitely see anything that's mind altering in a way that specifically when it's been received you know in a in a context of reverence and in context of respect in a context of connection you know to our past you know our ancestor this is a solution that can create myth 
So myth is what reconnect us together as a nation, or as people in the world everywhere. Um, and I guess, um, you know, it's psychedelic now that is their backs. Sorry, like sorry. Two, so what, 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 do you, what do you mean myth connects us? Um, myth is is the stories that we are sharing, right? And these stories are mostly are created in a in a collective psyche. You know, it's a psyche of you know people of a nation okay. or people of a region. So to contribute to to the myth of a group of people, you ha- this is where you know like you you have to have their psyches connected to each other. It's exactly like Ferdowsi and Shahnameh and all the stories that are connected, you know, different, you know, basically ethnicities in Iran mm. or different people in Iran and and everywhere else. Um, so, like for example, when you're looking into the Middle East and all the separations, I guess this is again where if we can look into creation of or you know just even um, reviving the myth, you know, from let's say two thousand years ago or four thousand years ago that, that there were no uh, such a thing as these borders, you know, at that time. Mm. So we can re like basically reconnect people and bring them together in a in a in a different. Um, level of connection. Mm. So yeah, I'm I'm looking into psychoactives as a very pragmatic solution for a shift in the in the mind in the state of the mind of people that you know contribute to better society or to better or to better citizenships. I I really I appreciate what you just said because oftentimes uh, the question gets asked on this show. I mean, I think I've asked it before. Of like, w- really, what is the purpose of uh, you know bringing up 2500 years ago you know we are the iranians who did this and you kind of go what's the connection for me uh, sitting in toronto even if i'm of iranian ancestry from that but we also in that process tend to think that everything we're doing or a lot of what we're doing is new including psychedelics like it's some sort of 20th century 21st century phenomenon because i grew up associating psychedelics with the generation before me the 1960s you know that's what they were doing and clearly psychedelics go back much further than the 60s and you make the case they can actually be traced back to ancient iran um so i suppose do you believe that the value of intoxication for the purpose of achieving ecstasy is of Iranian origin. And in fact, you've talked about there being a magic in ancient Iran that has been lost in contemporary society. What was the magic? First of all, it's it's very interesting because I count myself as a like kind of like a second generation who like, at least you now lived um, like half of my life in, in Iran. But now that we're talking about these topics, I'm actually receiving feedbacks from most of my first generation Iranian Americans or Canadians that they find this very interesting and fascinating that their basically parents' lands, you know, were were cool, you know, like it was it had you know the magic and so what is the magic this is this is actually how like i it brought me from my technical work to the world of ethnobotany which is basically the study of anthropology as well as uh plants so it is a relation between the, the plants of each region and the way that people were thinking or their psyche was was formed uh, or their psychology was formed so the magic of Iran is actually this is what I presented as part of this uh, this talk that uh, so the word magic actually comes from magi and magi in, even in English comes from mok or mok so mok is basically the, is a Zoroastrian priest so the Zoroastrian priest they are called mubed or mok which when the, this word when it came to English it became magi. And then basically the work of Magi, so the etymology of the word is the work of Magi was counted as magic. So Mm. the magic is an unknown connection to this whole world, you know, that Westerners, you know, or Europeans at that that time, they were kind of relating that to Iranians. Uh, And what they were doing, they, the the Zoroastrian priest, specifically, this this goes even before Zoroaster, who was the founder and prophet and philosopher of Zoroastrian, 
that there was shamanism in Iran even before that. There were paganism and shamanism. There were use of intoxicants, like psychedelics, like very heavy psychedelics. Iran is actually very interestingly, is the land of psychedelics. I've heard that like in hmm. the real, uh, in the recent ar archeologic um, excavations, you know, specifically in Russia, they have found up to eight different psychoactive compounds you know, from the remainder of, you know, of the drinks or you know, of the bowls you know, from, from that time. Um, but the main intoxicant that's even mentioned in Avesta or in Gatha, which was the, the holy book of Zoroastrian, is called Homa. And Homa, uh, Homa's botanical identity is lost. So this is one thing. The other thing is that Zoroastrian never wanted to relate their religion into an intoxicant. Mm. And this is for many reasons that I can open it up. Let me let me so actually stop is, you. Let me stop you because you've said a lot there. And I <laughs> I want to take it uh, one, one at a time uh, because it's really interesting. And, and I, I appreciate the way we're, you know, sometimes we, we relate being Iranian to... Uh, there was Cyrus the Great. There was some poets. Uh, Islam came. Then there was the Shah. Then there was a revolution, and now everything's everybody's pissed off. You know, we, there's, there's a sort of reductive. Whereas there's this rich history tapestry in so many different ways, and psychedelic drugs being very interesting. That that with this revival, especially in the West, to draw the to draw the origins back and go, oh, this is something that my ancestors were doing. So, so you mentioned shamanism or shamanism in ancient Iran. How does shamanism fit into the conversation about psychedelics today do this as simply as you can so that i understand this absolutely yes um you know this is um there are two uh pro distinctions about sh shamanism that uh, defines it like one is that they were using an intoxicant to have access to the to the realm of after death so basically the whole context of die before you die is basically by, by is by taking a, a chemistry or intoxicant that allows you to leave the body when you're still alive, go to the to the realm of divine and then like have access to the after death and come back. So this is this happens in Mesoamerica, in Peru, when they take ayahuasca. And this happens, you know, by those shamans. And it happens, you know, it, it was happening in Iran, too. So this is one context. Another context that shows that there was shamanism in Iran is the context of or the meaning of having a double. And having a double is a very interesting concept, which means that when we are living in this world of the materialistic world, which in the context of Zorasa, they were calling it GT. So you have a double, basically, Jian has a double, like Shaheen has a double in the other world, which is your higher self. So you live toward basically your your double and the same context of having a double again exists you no know, in, in in most of the sham, sham, you know, shamanistic rituals and beliefs it, it, it happened basically the same thing is in Siberia same thing is in, in in South America so these are the beliefs that shows that the same practices ritual and you know passage a rite of passages you know existed in that region too mm. and this is it's not only Iran, it was Iran as well as you know, India as well. And then 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 when they separated, when the Indo-Iranians separated, you know, and then they kind of like came to Sistan and Iran. So they created their own combination of paganism, which paganism is basically worshiping of uh, the higher power in the mm. nature, like water or, or wind. And then and then the whole the whole interesting part is that a philosopher like a teacher like Zoroaster built his a religion over paganism and shamanism. Yeah, let me get to the very... let me get to the revelation of Zoroaster, but but just two steps back. Why why do you think if you if you look at history and you look at that region, why were Zoroastrians in Iran um well placed to be among the pioneers of chemically induced otherworldly experiences? It, it was being practiced so wow. it was people were taking it so people were taking these substances and um so it's been soma is the equivalent of homo so they were taking these intoxicants mm. 
so basically taking intoxicant to have a, a an experience of ecstasy has been part of all the cultures and nations around the world you know um but it's just like how rigorous they discovered like mm. and for what purpose because this is a very thin line that why why you're using it and this is the whole reform of Zorastar that actually came around that why actually are, are you actually using it so specifically for example most of the warriors were taking intoxicant before going to war for battle fury mostly oh that's interesting because it was making them invigorated it was just making them brave you know like <sighs> Like basically they put it out. It's exactly like MDMA. You take MDMA, you know, to put aside the fear. So they were taking it to go to, to I'm war. Not, I'm not sure it'll help with the aim, but you know, maybe that's <laughs> <laughs> with help with the courage. That's good. But I mean, you in your talk, maybe this is just a sidebar. Let me ask you what you make a big distinction that Zoroastrianism is about is more so about the mind rather than the soul. Why is that important to know? Well, this is very important to know because um, so like anything that's related to a spirit or, you know, th this is a promise for for basically a life that you haven't lived, right? Like after death, this is a life after death. But psychology is what makes our today's life is just what makes our relations and what how makes you know the relation between culture relation mm -hmm. between countries so that basically the psychology is is the area that as much as we have developed you know you know people to be more intellectual or to physically taking care of themselves like they haven't been really trained to take care of their psychology and that's like that's why the psychology has uh, become a you know a big uh, big problem specifically mm. today, and it's gonna, it's gonna get worse, you know, just as we go forward, specifically with, with, with social media and access to so many, so much data, it's gonna get even worse. So that is why, you know, this timing is actually for looking back into psychedelics as a remedy for psychology and for a better state of mind has become, uh, you know, a, a significant time. Okay. Okay. So sorry, I caught you off earlier. Let, t tell me about the, I, I just wanted to p pin you down on a couple of these things. So I understand. So tell me about the revelation of Zoroaster. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, so these are referral to some of the out of body experiences that the Zoroastrian priests had. So these are part of a book of Zoroaster and called, called Bahman Yasht, which goes through the revelation of Zoroaster, which basically Zoroaster is taking Homa and then have a seven day and nights out of body experience where, where he has the revelation. He sees the other world, he sees good and bad. And then like, it's exactly like, again, die before you die, which Rumi comes in, in his poems. And then he comes back and he already knows. So it's, he receives this, you know, the omniscient knowledge. So all of a sudden he knows everything. He knows the whole thing. So this intoxicant had been part of the priestly kind of like, it's, it was an ordeal, you know, it was mm. a way to check that, let's say, these um, people are righteous or they really believe in, in the, it's exactly like, for example, today they send you to go do uh, extracurricular, you know, community based, you know, activity just to share to show that like you care for people, you believe in, in higher good. So this is exactly was the way for them to to see that, let's say, this next priest had the qualification, had the inner capacity to see the, 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 the mm -hmm. life after death and then basically come back and, and live and basically just help people or serve people. So in that sense, it's it was actually very unique and it was very interesting. And in, in my talk, I actually referred to that as maybe that was one of the reasons for two of the glorious history time in Iran, which was during the, uh, you know, our communities as well as the Sasani that we had, you know, basically a very complex and rigorous and you know advanced society at that time because the state of their mind was actually more advanced and tell me about the letter of arda viraz yes the letter of arda viraz is a very interesting book actually this is a 8000 words book that is one of the um it's basically this is interestingly this is close to 1300 years before the divine comedy of Dante Allegri. 
you know so just imagine that we had this story and this is a very detailed story that this is this that this story refers to a time which is after uh the archimedes time when uh alexander actually just invade iran and ruins and he dies and then the the iran is actually and people going through a state of um it's very similar to this time it's like a state of despair so they can't trust each other they can't they don't have that higher you know like connection to a, to it's either a religion or it's a belief so they were very they were kind of like lost and what happens is that like some of the priests of the zoroastrians so they basically invite people to come to one of the iran's fire temples which is kind of is this this fire temple is actually lost they were saying that this it was one of the main fire temples it's a fire temple of priests actually which close to farce it's called uh far far back or fire back and um so they invite people to come over and they then to show that the, their rituals are kind of like connected to the other realm so they decide to send somebody to go and and have this out of body journey to see that basically their rituals or their prayers are actually going or connected you know to the right place mm. somehow so basically they invite the viraz arda means arda means uh somebody who is right or, or a righteous person mm-hmm. so they, they invite viraz and other people to come and then they basically they just do a roll call or they try to find the best they find seven people first they then they invite three and then finally they find uh basically viraz you no know, actually viraz name come up and um and then he actually he doesn't want to do it because he thinks that he's going to die and but they say that if you are the righteous person you're not going to die don't worry mm. about this then his wives actually come and intervene and they say no we don't want this is actually tyranny to him no why are you going to kill him then again they say no we know that he is you know a right right person so we know who we are sending so um so from here it's exactly the context of taking psychedelics in a psychotherapy session so hmm. he he accepts to do this and then he goes and he set intentions he, you know he puts on his nicest clothes you know and then he uh, goes around fire he puts again um uh, you know the intention to go and then bring the the message from the other world and then he comes sit on a, a very nice tape uh, kind of like a bed which people were around him just chanting and basically just praying and then he he gets this potion which is called vishtaspian mang so he drinks it and then he basically he sleeps for 7 days and nights so basically this, this is a very long dream so part of it is story but pharmacologically it was very interesting because we were looking for a dream like state you know but what intoxicant you can take to put you in a dream like state in a way that like you right, dream right. for a long time yeah you mentioned homa a couple of times as being the 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 popular psychedelic or d- drug that people were using in in ancient iran or the zoroastrians were using uh, homa is spelt h a o m a homa what what exactly is it is it a liquid is it a potion is it something you drink what what is it so the meaning of homa so the word or homa or soma means to press out so basically there is a ritual that Zoroastrian has which is called yasna rite you know through the yasna rite it's it's a very long process so basically they they use a mortar and a pestle and mortar and then they put this you know plant and basically they they press it for long hours w- once they are just doing the ritual and they're praying and basically it's an it's an extract so okay. homa was an extract it was not one plant and uh so what were the compounds are unknown so there are speculations so there have been for example gordon wasson who actually brought psilocybin from mexico to north america who was a banker he actually has written a full book in 19 um i think 71 about soma which is like most of his referral is to vedic you know the rig veda and then he believes that like homa was amanita muscaria which is like the alice in wonderland mushroom but um but in the context of iran we don't have these mushrooms in iran so it means that like it was not mushroom. so, so do we know do, but what what do you suspect homa is closest to in terms of what we know today Yeah so homo in Iran today is a plant is is called ephedra 
Wow. So ephedra in Iran, like they are, it's growing on the mountainous areas. And I actually, I had a, I just, uh, just basically ordered about eight kilos of Homa, you know, to somebody that, um, to basically just take it for mm. me because we were, we were testing these. But <laughs> right. um, that's a lot of Homa. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of Homa. Yeah, and it's interesting. They were saying that Zoroastrian actually, they were just like basically just because India doesn't have. Ephedra. So Zoroastrian Irani, who lived in Iran, they were just shipping these to Zoroastrian Parsi, who actually left Iran, you know, many years ago. Uh, so this is another, you know, um, plant that in today's Zoroastrian, today, you know, they call this Homa. But there has been a research, you know, going on specifically since uh, around 1970s, you know, with uh, basically a very interesting gentleman that I met about a month ago in California that is like, it's very interesting. Like this, you see that these Westerner scholars kind of like have the magic of Iran that we could have lost it. Mm. So they, they have a book, which they're the combination of the book is like, he has on most of the uh, ethno pharmacological search. And then that's been combined with the work of a, a, a linguist a, a Western linguist who, who could read, you know, the Avesta, you know, the text of Avesta. So they believe that um, Homa, or at least one of the main compounds in the, in the intoxicant compound of Homa was uh, Pegonum Harmala, which Pegonum Harmala is the Iranian rue or Syrian rue or Esfand, which you find it in, in any Iranian's houses. Yeah, this freaked me out when I when or I found it very interesting <laughs> that S. Fand enters the com the the conversation because uh, I mean I know S. Fand is something uh, to to explain to those who don't know it or the non Iranians listening. It's kind of a it's something we burn for like my mom burns it in the kitchen for luck and to uh, presumably ward off evil spirits. Uh, and it's something that all Iranians would know about. It's a, uh, it's just like I thought it was like a seed or something that we burn. What what does esfand? How does esfand fit into psychedelics? Yes, esfand actually has compounds that are very psychoactive. Should I be smoking so. the esfand? Should I be stealing my mother's esfand? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because it's funny, actually has a lot of, uh, you know, um, other intoxicant too, you know, which are very toxic, but if, uh, but the extract, uh, some of the compounds that comes out from the extract are actually the main compounds that you find it in um, the in ayahuasca wine in South America. So these compounds are putting you in a, in a dreamlike state. Hmm. So what happens is that it allows you to basically to be to be awake while, while you're dreaming. So when, when you have access to the realm of dream, so that is where this whole, you know, like other beings, or mm. let's say things that you can process when you are, let's say, let's say when you're sleep dreaming, you, know, mm. you see things that you don't know what it is, you don't even remember. But when you're awake, you may encounter other beings that are not necessarily good. So that is why actually they were burning this fan to put the evil aside, you know. So a fan has been, you know, a, a sacred plan, you know, for the whole 4,000 years and it stayed in, in, in every Iranian houses. So, and it's a very um, high potency, um, specifically the seeds. And it's not only the seed, you know, the other part of the plant also has these alkaloids. So alkaloids are basically they're very small molecules that you can use you know, for therapeutic purposes. Mm. So, so these are the compounds that Esfand has that, that can be used for therapeutic applications. It's actually, now that I think about it, it, it is one of those things that we have been united uh, around for 4,000 years. <laughs> we can all agree on us then. It, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't have a political dimension or, or, or yes, something. Yes. Uh, you've talked about Iranian rulers taking Homa uh, during Nowruz back in the day and that type of thing. Uh, when you talk about rulers and you talk about Zoroaster and how commonplace was this? In other words, did the ordinary person have access to something like Homa? Were they doing psychedelics as well? Or, or was this for some rich royal class? Yes, yes. So Iran, if you know, like Iran during the, like those times, it had different castes. You know, there were castes of priests. 
there were casts of you know warriors and kings and there were casts of farmers so they they even had different um you know fire temples so the fire temple for priests was different from the fire temple for for warriors so it's uh, interestingly there is the, one of the most beautiful sites in iran is takht Soleiman, which is in 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 zanjan close to takov it's one of the i guess one of the places that you go crazy if you go and see it um, so this was the fire temple of you know warriors and and kings and uh, I guess, and the fire temple, you know, for farmers was close to Khorasan, northeast of Iran. So, the the use of Homa was very limited to the caste of priests, mm-hmm. and then they opened it to the kings. So that is why ordinary people never knew about this, unless there were like there was some referral as from some accounts to the Homa cult or the Homa club. That it seems that there were people who were taking this intoxicant for other reasons that is prohibited or denounced by Zoroaster, because these compounds can make you crazy too, right? So you have to do it in the right context for the right reason by the right people Mm. Uh, so that is how it stays only within very limited people and you know it was never and today nobody knows about this well also let me reiterate your you you gave a sort of disclaimer earlier that uh, zoroastrians deny any connection to intoxicants today so um why, why is that why why would zoroastrians not be proud of the uh, the, the revelation of Zoroaster. Yes, yes. So you know, like psychedelics are cool today, right? <laughs> it's been always, you know, uh, known as, as not not to everyone. They're not cool to everyone. I'm sure that we'll get some people. Yeah, who, they're not cool to right, everyone. Yeah, but, yeah. but 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 I, I guess one one main reason that they're saying is that first of all, like the revelation, you know, so they didn't want to relate the revelation of Zoroaster, who was really a, a philosopher, you know to the use of an intoxicant. So this intoxicant was being used, it's interesting that it was being used to put you in contact with truth. Mm. So this is the most interesting, you know, distinction from that time, because when you're taking these substances, you know what the truth is. You can't cover, you can't close your eyes anymore. So you know yourself, you know your psyche, you know your subconscious, you can see your subconscious. Um, and when you have access to that, you know, you, you become more real. So by the ruler, I mean, basically it was, it meant kings, you know, it would mean Cyrus. Yes, it yes. means like people around that time that they were, so basically there are, there are referral from Herodots, you know, as well as, you know, from like a few other accounts that one, like once per year during the Noruz or new year. So these kings also like Wishtas, which was offered by Zoroaster, they were taking this intoxicant. And so the whole theory or the question is, if there is a relation between these glorious times, between, for example, when when Cyrus now goes to Mesopotamia and they just basically frees everybody, let the Jews come back to Jerusalem, you know, basically set up a, a uh, you know, a kind of like a very equal system for all people. Uh, free all the slaves. So are these, you know, steps or are these, you know, uh, state of, the state of mind behind these doings, is it related to taking of an, basically taking an intoxicant that allows you to be, to, mm. to be connected to more to truth? So this is, this is what, what the magic was. So this is, and this continued, you know, during the Archimedes time, Hachamanishian, as well as the Sasanid time. And then after that, there was basically the conquest of Islam, which, you know, this was another reason that the Zoroastrian priest didn't want to be related to sorcery as well as, you know, uh, basically witchcraft, you know, mm. by use of in this intoxicant. So, like, the, basically, these intoxicants were shying away and away, but because they were part of the text and they were still part of the text, so the, the identity of the compound changed and became a compound that doesn't have that intoxication effect anymore. This is it's it's fascinating stuff. The historical origins are um, have been such a revelation to me in terms of learning some of the details that you've spoken about uh, today and that I've I've seen you talk about or read about um, in in recent days. Uh, let me bring us back to the the contemporary world uh, and let me reiterate uh, sort of where we started with this talk today before we end off with a couple of questions about. 
Um, why do you believe, uh, beyond good business for your startup, uh, of course, and and beyond uh, having a good time at some parties, why do you believe we should care about psychedelics? I guess psychedelics are is it basically psychedelics are a tool. So what we should care more about is, you know, basically a more elevated state of mind, you know, a state of mind that allows, again, better citizenship, better, you know, distribution of resources among people, or like, and basically having better societies. So we, we, uh, we see more and more that how we are connected to each other, you know, from a pandemic, you know, to the isolation of Iran, which like we have all of our loved ones there. So the isolation is not the way to go. So it's been, it's not, it's been, it hasn't been serving anybody. So I think that the psychological shift is the next shift for, for a societal change. Mm. So this is, um, this is the reason behind this. Uh, but but what it needs is it needs you no know, healthier mind. It needs healthier minds that are not selfish. They are not like just looking into their own benefits and and advantages, but you know to something bigger. And like surprisingly, you know the the whole pharmaceutical, as well as you know, the psychiatry, hasn't been really successful in coming up with with medication that doesn't make you numb to forget about your problem, but actually puts you in a state that you feel the pain, you feel the suffering, but then you can heal yourself. Right. So these are the healing that goes, let's say, to, to put us free is coming from basically some some mental work or mental health work that we all have to be committed to do so that is why why you know like this is a very interest like very important time for for this industry so you're the co-founder of something called vsena I, I mentioned in the introduction and we talked a bit about it. tell us what the mission of vsena is the the Vicena actually comes from Avicenna, who was or Ibn Sina, who was the actually the Persian polymath as well as uh, the, the the father of pre modern medicine in Iran, who actually like went through about four hundred herbs and found their pharmacological advantages and tested on people and then uh, yes put it in his in, into his books. So that's where the name as well as the legacy comes from. But in like aside from business, what I'm very fascinated fascinated with is the content that comes from our country and our culture that is kind of lost and most of the Iranians they don't even like looking to those but this is what we have to revive and just make it global so this is part of my own mission to bring this this magic and knowledge that comes from like very wise men and and, and the high, very high wisdom in Iran that uh, has a lot of consumers around the world um, but with Vicena is basically a biotech, very high bio, uh, advanced biotech company mm. that we are uh, doing drug discovery and development for mental wellness, as well as central uh, nervous system um, disorders. Is it, is, it, is it fair to say that the success of your, yeah. the global success of your company will also hinge on uh, laws, right? On, on, on whether... It, this the the use of psychedelic drugs, psychoactive drugs, uh, for healing, for mental awareness, for clinical use, uh, is made legal around the world. Yes, yes, um, yes. Yeah, some countries, like for example, Portugal, are very leading in this area. Canada is actually one of the most leading countries. Uh, in so basically, the psychedelics has meaning in a context of in a medicalized context at this point. So the whole promise is that you have to take it through clinical trial to show that they are safe and they are efficacious, and then make it them you know a drug. So legalization, there are also you know, lots of campaigns around, specifically U.S. You know, for legalizing, for example, psilocybin. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, you know, nobody knows like which direction goes faster. But that's also, you know, the decrim or they call it decriminalization is another route that there are so many people are working on. And Oregon, 
uh, or Colorado are kind of um, the you know the edge. You know, well, I I, I, w- I wouldn't have believed it's possible on, until we've seen what's happened with marijuana and cannabis in the last uh, decade. I mean, you know, twenty years ago, it was really hard to conceive of this uh, this sea change. And you talk about Canada leading the way, for example, in in clinical trials to use psychedelics for mental health. H- how close do you? suspect we are uh, for it to it being commonplace for psychedelics to be prescribed by your family doctor. Yeah, so you know that there's already one psych, psych- psychedelic in the market and that is ketamine. So there are ketamine clinics that you can go and basically take ketamine and Johnson and Johnson is actually the main company that are producing Esperato, you know, which is you know a source of ketamine. But ketamine is very dissociative. So after ketamine, you know, in in the, there are psilocybin and MDMA in phase three trial, which with that are looking into three to five years, you know, to become a, a legal basically drug that can come to market. But you should not forget, like at a specific to your listener, that the whole psych, psychedelics at this point is in the context of psychedelic psychotherapy. Mm. So basically you have to go into a session with a psychotherapist who is, you know, giving you the psychedelic and then on this four to eight hour, whatever you know, time that you go to that alter the state of consciousness, you are watched, you know, by someone who is, you know, holding a space for you or mm. just, or you kind of like guides you through your trip. So it's not, they're not going to give you, you know, a psychoactive compound to go to your own house and take it. To a rave, <laughs> well, but I should also note that I mean we've already said that this, you know, this chat has not been about promoting illicit drug use. But uh, as far as I know, psychedelics are not like mushroom are not addictive, right? In the same way that cocaine would be, or something. This is there. There isn't the um, the same kind of. It's interesting that they're illegal in the sense that the implications are different, aren't they? Yeah, so the they are specifically like you know, like most of the psychedelics are used as as a you know as a therapy for basically getting rid of addiction. So they are psilocybin, and um, as well as you know, um, like uh, like and DMT for example. So there are clinical trials that are already being on on their first one or phase two, you know, for different type of you know, addiction to nicotine to uh, alcohol to cocaine. So they are not binding to, you know, opioid receptors. So they are not making you addicted, you know, in, in terms of, let's say, you're in a, in a receptor, brain receptor level. But what they are detrimental for different people. For example, if you are bipolar mm. or if you are psychotic, if you take psychoactives, it puts you in a state that you can never come back to to a normal living. Wow. Um, right. I guess the, the most important part, if you know, is like they call it the set, setting and dose, which the set is the mindset. Setting is where you're taking the psychoactive and dose is how much you're taking it. So these are the protocols for a safe use of psychedelic in the context that you reduce the harm and then you can get benefit. You can like you can get exact same amount and get traumatized rather than get de-traumatized. Mm. So this is exactly like a you know, double edged sword that you have to do it in the right context in a way that it serves you. Otherwise, you know, it can put you in this, it can traumatize you. This is the most difficult, the basically just harmful part. That's not addiction, but it can, you know, lead to something disastrous. I think, well, very disastrous. It's fair to say that everybody should check what's right for them. I mean, uh, even even in less uh, dramatic circumstances uh psychoactive uh, like coffee is not good for some people uh they they yeah. go crazy on it you know so um sugar it's, 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 yeah exactly <laughs> sugar yeah yeah it's yeah, it's yeah. it's a good it's a good uh thing to say it's a good warning it's been such an interesting conversation uh with you i i'm so grateful for the time it's nice to see you i i i feel like i'd be remiss since you're sitting in tehran uh to end the conversation without asking you about iran and um, g- given the roots of psychedelics that we've talked about in, I- in Iranian history, what do you witness about their use in Iran today? Yeah, I guess in Iran, um, like usually there's no education behind the use of 
um, any substances. And uh, so I guess this is one observation, which, for example, alcohol is always hard alcohol or hard, hard liquor, um, cigarettes, just like back to back. And um, so I think there's this tendency that is like a trend that you're cool if you do this. Mm. Um, so there is, I guess, one part is education that um, they're taking, for example, different drugs together. But at the same time, you know, psychedelics has been in like being used in Iran, like the mushrooms. Or I even recently knew that there were like two Brazilian shamans actually just hosting ayahuasca session in Tehran. You know, like they were just wow. traveling from one city to the other city. So, yes. But the thing is, again, um, how I see this specifically just like mostly around the the party culture or rave culture is that like they are just mixing things that they should not mix. They are taking doses that they should not take, you know, those doses. And I guess I see this mostly, first of all, as lack of education. Um, and the second is, um, yeah, and I don't know about psychedelic, but let's say if you look into some of the other uh, you know, let's say cocaine, for example, in Tehran, they're like, they're mixing it, you know, with other compounds yeah. just to, and, and that leads, you know, into uh, a lot of, you know, side effects, you know, which are not favorable. So this is the culture that I've seen here. Um, but, but I can see that specifically in Iran, as I know, mostly from the psychotherapy side, there are so many people looking, you know, for, you know, solution for their, uh, life issues or their mental wellness issues you know that if this happens in the right context would serve so many people Shaheen Etzminan I very much appreciate your time today thanks for doing this yes thank you Jean it's my pleasure to talk to you and your team and yeah all the good work you guys doing thank you brother bye 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 for now Shaheen Etzminan, an Iranian-Canadian entrepreneur, activator, futurist, and community builder. He is the founder of Vicenna, a CNS drug discovery biotech company. And his recent talk is entitled Chemically Induced Otherworldly Experiences of Zoroastrians in Iran. We reached Shaheen Etzminan in Tehran, Iran today. There you go, Shia. Oh, that was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, what did you, I think so too. What yeah. did you find the most interesting? I mean, the, what didn't I find very <laughs> interesting? Like the, the use of psychedelic in, in the ancient Iran, the way that like they, t they took it and they went trip for three days for seven days seven days yeah, seven yeah. days and they came back and they w they wanted to give it back to the society you know? it's again it's one of those things that we are so sometimes uh ego driven uh, in our own present day to think that everything started with us you know <laughs> like psychedelics well that was the boomers <laughs> that was in the 60s yeah. actually it was <laughs> thousands of years ago yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, and the idea of two selves, oh, yeah. and the idea of and achieving a higher, you know, sense of, of one's yeah. world, and yeah, that was it was very fascinating, and and kind of a I, we we kept saying, I mean, this is not meant to be a a promotion for illicit drug use, mm -hmm. but uh, if you know if these clinical trials bear out that yeah. this is as positive as it seems mm -hmm. um it's a huge step forward to legalize this stuff or yes. decriminalize or yes. whatever you need to do to yeah. to let people use these things mm -hmm. let um medical workers whatever use these things to help people right yeah yeah correct or therapists or you know. yeah i uh, i i think Tonight I'm going to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in honor know. of my birthday. You <laughs> will go on to. <laughs> I don't know if I smoke a span or <laughs> I know. That was that the S fan thing. Right, was when I was researching him, that part really freaked <laughs> yeah. me out. The yeah. S fan I'm, now I'm gonna be like yeah. wondering what you know my parents were doing all that time with the S fan. <laughs> you know? It seemed so innocent before. Yeah. Uh there you go. Um, thank you very much again to Dr. Shahi Netminan joining us from Tehran. This is full time for Rook for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Our website, rookmedia.com, is where you can find everything 
about Rook, our guests, our previous episodes, our different programs, our funnies, our videos, rookmedia.com, of course, R-O-Q-E media.com where you can also get in touch with us to become a sponsor or you can just press the support us button and become a patron of our program thanks to the amazing team who put this show together savvy roham talented anahita ponta the artist the fabulous Keon, super parisa smart pega Ray Merdod, captain reza and groovy shia thank you to all of you out there for supporting us sharing our content please subscribe if you've not done so already on all or any of our platforms find me on instagram at gian gomeshi and as ever mizunbashi mizunbashi